This is going to be the second part of part two on uh, parsimony. Uh, we're going to complete uh, our discussion of how exactly we can use parsimony to reconstruct phylogenetic trees. All right, so we're going to pick the tree that gives us uh, the least number of steps. How do we do this? Well, our evidence is the similarity of species in their shared derived characters, their synapomorphies, and we talked about this uh, earlier. Remember that only synapomorphies, the shared derived characters, will give us uh, a group unambiguously. As long as we work with synapomorphies, we'll be able to put things into clades and do it correctly. All right? And so what we really end up doing is we group uh, species together with other species that have the most shared derived characters. Uh, and the reason that we have to do that and why we have to apply parsimony is that with a given data set, Sometimes it may be possible to do more reconstructions that are equally parsimonious, or it may be possible to do multiple reconstructions where we get something called character conflict. Now, what do we mean by character conflict? What we mean is that, say you're doing a, a, a phylogenetic tree and you've got two different characters, number of toes and, say, color of fur. It may be that the color of a group of species fur tells you to put things together one way and that the number of toes that they have tells you to put it together a different way. That's what we call character conflict. So what we would do is we would gather as many characters as we could and then that's why we go to parsimony. We look at the different reconstructions even with those character conflicts and we say given the character conflicts which of these trees has the least number of steps in it? In other words where do we minimize the number of conflicts? And once we do that, we can then say this is our best tree because we're minimizing the number of conflicts in our data set. Now, why would we get that? Let's take a look at an example of this uh, and uh, try to make sense of why we would ever see this happen. Suppose I have species one, two, three, and four. Okay, and now we're going to look at a character data set for them. So this is going to be character number one, character number two, character number three, and character number four. So let's take character one, and let's say character one has the following features. And character two has the following features. And then character three is like the following. And character four, yeah, let's do that. Yeah, we'll do that with red. Looks like the following. So let's look at what they're indicating. Let's assume that the, the capital letters that I just drew are the synapomorphies. So for character number one here, it suggests that species one, two, and three ought to be grouped together into a clade of some kind, which we would draw like this for the time being because we don't know. how they should be grouped with respect to each other. And then for character two, though, it looks like one, two, and four should all be in a clade together. So for character number two, it looks like what we should do is the following. Okay. For character number three, it also looks like one, two, and four should be together. And for character number four, it also looks like one, two, and four should be together. So we have a character conflict here. Uh, character number one tells us one, two, and three belong together in a clade. And these other three characters here, two, three, and four, tell us that one, two, and four should be in a clade. So the most parsimonious way to do this is to have one, two, and four be in a clade because there's more evidence supporting that. And we only need one change for that. 
let's take a look at how that's going to look on the tree here. So we have a change on this tree where it goes from little b to big B. Okay, so we'll draw the big B there. The ancestral character, which we'll put down here, is the little b. And the same thing would be true for C and D. At this point, we would go to the capital version of characters C and D as well. Okay, and then what would happen for our character number one? Well, one, two, and three all have big A, um, and only four has little a. So we just simply say that there's an evolution to little a right here. Okay. And that's going to be more parsimonious than what we have to do up here, because what we have to do up here is we have to say that there are more changes taking place on this tree than there were on the other tree. So why should parsimony be the right way to do things? Um, why should we assume that the simplest tree, that is the tree with the least number of steps, is actually the correct tree? And parsimony only really works if evolutionary change is improbable. And what we mean by that is that there shouldn't be a lot of changes taking place between an ancestor and its descendant. So what we've drawn here is an ancestor that has character A, big A, and we have a descendant that also has character big A. Now the advantage of this, if this is parsimony, is that there's been no other changes occurring on that branch. The ancestor is big A and the descendant is big A because the descendant inherited big A from that ancestor. Where parsimony would fail is if there were a lot of changes taking place on this branch. So for example, if big A and the ancestor then evolved to little a, and then after that evolved to A prime, and from A prime back to big A, and then to alpha, and then to little a and to alpha, and then back to big A, it's true in this case that the ancestor and the descendant have the same character. They both have big A, but the descendant now does not have the uh, characteristic big A because it inherited that directly from its ancestor. In fact, the big A characteristic in the descendant is something that has arisen brand new, and it's just by chance that it's the same as the ancestor. So when we have lots of evolutionary change taking place on a branch, then parsimony is the wrong assumption because, in fact, the most parsimonious answer isn't the correct answer in this case, that, that big A in the descendant was inherited directly from the ancestor having big A. All right, so how realistic is it to say that parsimony should be used? Well, parsimony works just fine if the character that you're working with uh, is inherited correctly. Um, it works really well for complex organs like, say, an eye. Um, and the reason is that the complex organs uh, are unlikely to evolve exactly the same way twice because of their complexity. And so if two things appear the same way in a complex organ, again, like the eye, then it's, there's a pretty good chance that parsimony is the right uh, answer to that. It's not quite so good if you're working with simple characters like DNA sequences. And the reason for that is pretty straightforward. Remember, DNA only has four bases. And so the probability of two bases being the same just by chance is literally 25% because there's only four, uh, there's only four different uh, characters that can be at any one position in a DNA sequence. We still do use parsimony with DNA, but there are some other things that we have to do to make sure that parsimony is a reasonable uh, way of working with DNA sequences. All right, and then finally what we do is we root the tree. So we take our unrooted tree that doesn't have a time dimension and we put time on it. And we'll talk about how we do this when we work on uh, morphological methods. All right, now producing a tree seems pretty simple, but it's often really quite challenging. Um, and we'll look at reconstruction using both morphological and molecular information. Uh, and this diagram is something we'll come back to over and over again. Because when we work through morphological features, like along this pathway here, we're going to have to reconstruct the tree differently than if we're working with molecular features, and that is working along this pathway 
here.